Hello and welcome to the webinar, Three Successful Strategies for Using Primary Sources in the Classroom, brought to you by Constitutional Rights Foundation. Uh, we're going to go ahead and introduce all of the hosts here today, uh, starting with me. I'm Damon Huss and I am a senior editor here at Constitutional Rights Foundation. Good afternoon, I'm Gregorio Medina, Senior Program Director, Constitutional Rights Foundation. And my name is Keith Matea, and I am also a Senior Program Director for the Constitutional Rights Foundation. Webinar is going to cover three successful strategies, and we're going to use one for U.S. government, that's for high school social studies, one in U.S. history, which is for middle school social studies, but could also be used in a high school classroom, and also world history uh, for middle school primarily, but you can adapt it for a high school classroom if you wish. And also the materials that we're using today are going to be available as resources, some of which are online already. And we will send an email out to participants who registered for this website uh, so you have access to all the free resources that we're going to be talking about today. Again, it is free, and so everything we're using today is going to be available to you after the webinar. I'm going to introduce uh, Constitutional Rights Foundation briefly for any of our participants out there who might not be familiar with Constitutional Rights Foundation. Uh, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Our office is here in Los Angeles, but we have national programs like Civic Action Project and others. Um, and we go to national and various state conferences as well. So you may have seen some of us presenting at conferences uh, in your state or nationally at NCSS. All of our materials that we produce, the materials that we're going to show you today, are balanced in the spirit of our being a nonpartisan organization, but also in the spirit of fostering critical thinking. Our mission is to educate the next generation about their rights and responsibilities as citizens in a democratic republic. And so we focus on the Constitution and Bill of Rights, but we also focus on civic education generally, including history, government, and other uh, areas in the social studies. Uh, you may know us also through Bill of Rights in Action, and you'll receive a link in the email after this webinar letting you know how you could subscribe to that for free. It's for U.S. history, U.S. government, and world history teachers, too. And also, give us a brief answer, if you would, to this question. How do you use primary sources in your classroom? Do you, for example, do you read them uh, in class as supplements to a lesson in social studies or history? Or do you use them to introduce a lesson in social studies or history? Do you use close reading? Do you use multiple sources? How do you use primary sources? See, uh, hi, Laurel. Uh, Laurel says, engage students with the past. Very good. Yeah, primary sources are an excellent way to engage students with the past very directly. DBQs, document-based questions, close reading, multiple sources, excellent. Eric shares with us policy debates. That's something that we specialize in here at CRF. And yeah, primary sources are excellent for policy debates, even when you're looking at a historical subject. What are some historical laws or policies? And in fact, we're going to take a look at some today. You may have, uh, of course, already picked up on, we're doing a lesson on US government. And usually, we associate primary sources with history. But of course, in teaching US government, there's also quite a bit of history that goes into that. So primary sources are useful even in a subject that may uh, connect students to current events or important current issues as well. All right, we're going to move forward and just take a look at a little bit of what we're doing. We've Keith and I already have mentioned a couple of things that we're going to be looking at today, and you've anticipated a lot of them in your notes in the chat area. But our objectives today are generally these two. Uh, you're going to be able to use Common Core aligned approaches to examining primary source documents in the classroom. So we're going to focus on uh, reading strategies, writing strategies, and speaking and listening strategies. And you're also going to participate in three lesson demonstrations using primary sources. So we're going to look at three different strategies, and we're going to talk about those uh, also at the end on how they might appear in your classroom. Of course, you're also going to learn about some content today. We're going to talk about uh, different areas of content in those subjects. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Keith Matea, and he's going to talk to you about an interesting subject in world history. Oh, thank you, Damon. Uh, so to start off, uh, I put up here an excerpt from Montesquieu. Uh, and what I want you to do is just read the text as best you can uh, so that we can engage in a discussion. So I'll give you a little bit of time to read, and then we'll discuss. All right, I don't want to belabor this for too long, but 
let's not actually engage in a discussion of this text like this. Um, I actually did this. This is uh, when I remembered learning or using primary sources in high school. This is almost always how my teachers presented it. We got a bad Xerox copy given to us. We weren't really given any sort of direction as to how to, how to address the text. Um, oftentimes, we could barely read everything on there. And we weren't given a lot of context. Uh, and I even remember I was telling uh, Damon and Gregorio, uh, I actually once had a teacher yelling at the class uh, because he gave us a text. Um, we didn't really know what to say or even how to address it. Uh, so he was getting very fl uh, flustered with us. Um, we are going to return to Montesquieu a little later on. Um, but again, I wanted to start off about how we're not going to do things. And I really want you to think about sort of these better approaches, hopefully, that we're going to be doing uh, in a moment. So, but we will be returning to this. Um, I do think it's an interesting text, and there is some really interesting ways to address it. Uh, but before we get to that, um, let's actually deal with some better strategies. Uh, so Greg is going to be showing uh, us one of the lessons from our Civic Action Project uh, and how to get students interested in document analysis. Thanks, Keith. So the first lesson we're going to explore today is called Building Constituencies. This is one of the 14 lessons from our Civic Action Project website. This lesson uses a strategy of primary source document analysis to deepen a student's understanding of a specific historical event and the social context in which that event took place. In this case, the event in question is a Montgomery bus boycott. So I'd like to very quickly um, go over the objectives for the lesson, and this is what the students will be doing. They'll be describing how building constituencies is an important civic action, using once again the Montgomery bus boycott as an example, and analyze a primary document to identify different civic actions that boycott leaders use or consider to build support for the boycott. So those are the objectives of the lesson. Now you're all probably very familiar with the Montgomery bus boycott. And indeed, some of you may be virtual experts on the topic. But what I would like you to do right now is to review the, this list of civic actions and select all of the actions you believe were completed work of the Montgomery bus, bus boycott. So we have a letter to the mayor, distribution of pamphlets and leaflets, letters to a national media, advertisements in local newspapers, contacting national organizations, organizing alternative transportation, and an essay contest for high school students. So select all of those actions that you thought were a part of the Montgomery bus boycott. Very good. Of course, organizing alternative transportation. Obviously, if it's a boycott on public transportation, that's definitely one of the first thing actions that were completed and organized, one of the primary ones. Well. All of those choices are correct, and if you chose all of the above, that would be the correct answer because actually each and every one of those civic actions were actually taken to support the Montgomery bus boycott. And in this lesson, the one that we're going to review, you'll actually find primary source documents related to each of the listed items. What I'd like you to do is I really want you to pay particular attention to the tone, language, and any other elements that really place this document in a particular historical time period. So first, a little background of the leaflet. Following the arrest of Rosa Parks, leaders in the African American community decided action must be taken. Joanne Robinson and a fellow professor at Alabama State College, which was a segregated school at the time, drafted a leaflet which they and two students distributed throughout the African-American community. Reverend Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy revised the leaflet and distributed again over the weekend. The revised leaflet also urged people following the boycott to attend a gathering at 7 p.m. on Monday at Hull Street Baptist Church. And in the very next slide, you will see an, expert, an excerpt from the actual leaflet, which I will read for all of you. This is for Monday, December 5th, 1955. Another Negro woman has been arrested and thrown into jail because she refused to get up out of her seat on, on the bus for a white person to sit down. This is the second time since the recent case that a Negro woman has been arrested for the same thing. This has to be stopped. Negroes have rights too, for if Negroes did not ride the buses, they could not operate. Three-fourths of the riders are Negroes yet we are arrested or have to stand over empty seats. If we do not do something to stop these arrests, they will continue. The next time it may be you or your daughter or mother. This woman's case will come up on Monday. We are therefore asking every Negro to stay off the buses Monday in protest of the arrest and trial. Don't ride the buses to work, 
to town, to school, or anywhere on Monday. You can afford to stay out of school for one day if you have no other way to, to, to go except by bus. You can also afford to stay out of town for one day. If you work, take a cab or walk. But please, children and grown-ups, don't ride the bus at all on Monday. Please stay off all buses on Monday. So I'd like you to start, what is surprising or interesting about this document? So once again, really look at the tone, um, some of the language that's being used. What really places this in a particular historical period? Anything about this document that right away you know will let the students know that there's something different about how people spoke and how they mobilized. Oh yes, use the chat area, absolutely, yeah, to respond to some of these. Yes, absolutely, the term Negro. Um, that's definitely not used today. Some people may actually even consider it offensive, but this was common nomenclature back in the day, even in the African American community. Obviously, the date at the top definitely places it in a specific historical period. And Marianne writes, uh, you can afford to stay out of school, which is something her students would be surprised by. Yeah, I was surprised by. I was actually surprised by it myself, but there's a very urgent tone to this message. So it really conveys once again just how important this was at the time to these particular group of people that were organizing this boycott. So how does the analysis of this document contextualize and increase understanding of this particular historical event? Yes, how it was distributed. Obviously, this was manually distributed. This was not something that, this was something that people were standing on street corners and actually going to schools and other um, community um, centers to inform people about the boycott. And also the language, very plain and not necessarily formal, but very accessible language on this particular. I would, I, I would point out when you're using primary sources, a lot of times using uh, primary sources with accessible language are really valuable and actually tell us a lot more about history sometimes than really formal documentation. And there's actually multiple examples in this particular lesson where you'll actually see the contrast between the type of language that was used depending on the audience that they were reaching out to. Um, there's an example of a letter to Time Magazine. Um, there's an excerpt, excerpt from Al Rath Albernathy's recollections of the time period. But going back to the, less, the excerpt of the lesson that we just saw, that particular lesson, these are the common core connections or standard connections that it has, um, citing specific textual evidence to support analysis of primary and secondary sources, connecting insights gained from details to an understanding of the text as a whole, determining the central ideas or information of a primary or secondary source, providing an accurate summary that makes clear the relationships among the key details and ideas, integrating information from diverse sources, and once again, there's several examples in this particular lesson, both primary and secondary into coherent understanding of an idea or event. So this is just one example of how document analysis can really help students not only gain a really deeper understanding of the social context in which a particular historical event took place. So the leaflet we just examined is once again just one of eight examples of primary source documents um, that students can analyze to gain a deeper understanding of the Montgomery bus boycott. If you want to get access to the lesson, you can simply um, log on and register to the Civic Action Project website and um, gain direct access to this lesson and, and, and 14 others. And you'll gain access once again. You'll be able to see there's eight different examples directly related to that list of civic actions that we reviewed earlier. Uh, so we're going to be jumping from our Civic Action Project lessons to our uh, group of lessons called the History Experience. Our History Experience lessons are, are really a practicum. I think students interested in inquiry-based and project-based learning of history. Uh, it includes everything from how to choose a topic and form a research question to inducting research and evaluating sources. And we will, of course, provide you uh, links for these lessons. And as always, they are Common Core aligned. Uh, the History Experience does have five lessons. Uh, it's lesson one. Uh, it's on you know, introductory lesson. We're going to be focusing on lesson two, writing the Declaration of Independence. Uh, lesson three, Declaration's Ideas. Uh, lesson four shows them how to do historical research. And lesson five focuses on getting students to think about the reliability of sources, uh, something that I think is really valuable to, for students to learn about. As I said, we're going to be really focusing on part of lesson two, and we're going to be trying to make this interactive. Uh, I don't want this to be me just yammering on about uh, the history experience. Uh, so I just want to briefly show you what the lessons look like. And again, these are all, gonna, all free, and we will provide you links to all of them. Uh, so, you know, like all of our lessons, it has an overview, it gives you objectives, it connects it to the standards, uh, it talks about, it, it provides you with all the materials uh, and the procedure uh, for how to run the lesson. 
It uh, provides a, um, some questions for students. Uh, it provides a short write-up uh, so that students can learn a little more about the background of the Declaration of Independence. We have that right here uh, so that they do have the context for it. So as you can see, everything's included that you're going to need uh, if you were going to be teaching these lessons. And uh, we're going to be doing the activity in your own words, or at least part of it. Uh, obviously, we have limitations for a webinar and doing the full activity. Uh, but this is a sort of uh, culmination activity for it. So the writing the Declaration of Independence lesson, uh, we're going to be really focusing on the idea of self-explanation. And self-explanation is getting uh, is when students really have to explain the meaning of a text. Uh, they're more likely to make inferences. They're more uh, likely to think of it as solving problems when they have to explain it themselves. Uh, and they really understand the text on a deeper level. Uh, but what I found when students engage in self-explanation, and here we're going to be having, uh, you would have them rewrite part of the part of the Declaration of Independence for themselves. Um, it's not something that exists, uh, a strategy that exists in a, bu a bubble. Uh, really, there's a sort of tie, and I've tied it into close reading and a vocabulary list. The vocabulary list is really a sort of practical way of engaging in self-explanation and close reading, uh, but it is, a, I think, a really important practical way of, of doing that. So right here we have quickly a vocabulary, the vocabulary list for this lesson. And what you see with the vocabulary list here, there's really, I think, a, when, when you're thinking of uh, giving uh, students a section of, primary, of a primary source uh, and phrases or words they have to figure out, I really think there's three categories. Um, there's difficult vocabulary, uh, so maybe something like revolution. Maybe they, they've heard the word clearly, but they may not know exactly what it means. Um, you could have complex terminology, you know, something like, let's see here, the pursuit of happiness. Like, what does that mean? I mean, that's not 100% clear what, how, how that would be understood to different people at different times. And then, of course, unfamiliar names, places, or events. So Philadelphia or the Second Continental Congress. Um, it's important for reading a text to understand the context, uh, both in the background reading and also in the text itself. Close reading uh, create, or using a vocabulary list is, is certainly part of the strategy. Uh, and close reading, again, is really important to supporting self-explanation. Uh, but close reading is a strategy that was developed for literary criticism. And nowadays, his, uh, historians use it for analysis of texts. Um, students can use it. Uh, and if, when they do use it, they're really truly acting like a historian. Uh, and it really involves, I mean, if, to break it down in the simplest terms, a very careful reading of a selection of text, um, paying attention to individual words and sentences. Uh, and annotation is a really, really important part of that. Uh, annotation is when you go into the text, it's not just underlining sentences, not just uh, you know, highlighting uh, various words. It's really engaging in the text. It's writing questions. It's uh, making notes. Uh, and that sort of active annotation is really important for student understanding and helps them and leads to that step of self-explanation. I, mean, I also think it's interesting. I've worked with historians. Uh, and it, it's always interesting the annotations that historians make when uh, translating text. Those often become the footnotes. So when students engage in close reading and do that through annotation and creating vocabulary lists, they're really copying almost exactly what historians actually do. Uh, we're going to do a little activity here. So for the actual lessons, what we have students do uh, after they have a discussion about Declaration of Independence, um, after uh, they read the background, um, we give them a selection of text. And this is uh, the whole selection of text that we give them to put into their own words. Now, I don't want you to write uh, in your own words what, every, what this entire passage means. But what I would like you to do is read the passage. I'm sure you've all read it before. And I'd like you to put in your own words what you think life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness means. So if you're going to reword that, how would you, how would you put that? And you can put that over in the discussion uh, or dialogue box on the left. Now, I, I realize life might be a little straightforward. But really, liberty has mean, meant different things to different people. And what does the pursuit of happiness mean? And again, for any of these, you can use phrases instead of just trying to find three words. So we have some comments coming here. I wouldn't change a thing. It stood, it stood the test of time, allows interpretations of time's demand. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting way. I would encourage, you know, in this type of situation where students are rewriting and they really you know, already like the wording of something, um, to ask them to explain, I mean, as Judy has done here, why they want to keep things the same. I was here, to be free to live my life in a place where individual rights are guaranteed. That's, I think that's a great point, and very much in line with the passage. 
a couple of uh, folks here have written uh, free, to do these things free from government interference. I think free from government interference in private affairs. This is going to be really interesting. That's a good point that people have been putting here. You know, individual freedom, freedom from government interference uh, has been put up here. Um, when we go, think of, I'll keep that in mind when we get back to the excerpt from Montesquieu, uh, who was very influential on, uh, the found, on the founders and how they thought about liberty. So just really keep that in mind. I'm currently reading some material for another program regarding property rights and our founding. Uh, and life is viewed as the right uh, to the property of one's own body. Uh, that women would view life as the right to their own body. Yeah, that's in interesting, yes. I also like to point out for this, uh, sometimes when I talk to teachers and they talk about the pursuit of happiness, um, that comes from a phrase from, or often it's connected to a phrase from John Locke, uh, and they, he, uh, Jefferson took uh, pursuit of happiness and replaced pursuit of, or property with pursuit of happiness. Uh, and I encourage everyone to, uh, check into uh, Jefferson's interest in Epicureanism uh, and how he came across the uh, pursuit of happiness. So I hope you can see, I hope you can see here um, that you take a I mean, you're taking a section of text and asking people to explain or put their own self-explanation on it, even just a short little phrase, uh, it can lead to a lot of sort of interesting discussion about what things mean, um, how people have different thoughts about uh, the meaning of text. Um, and it's just, again, engaging in self-explanation, proven way to uh, get students to really understand what text can mean. With that, I'm going to be turning it over to Damon. And Damon's going to be discussing how to use a guiding question to get students interested in using primary sources. That's right. Thanks, Keith. So um, transitioning here to world history, we're going to do an activity best we can here in the webinar. Uh, I think you'll, you'll see that it will be interactive, called the code. Uh, and in this lesson, students, but in this case you, are going to be working to act as archaeologists to make inferences about society from analyzing ancient laws. Now, you're just going to be uh, doing this individually with yourselves, uh, but students will be working in groups this way. And as Keith mentioned, I'm going to be focusing on a strategy that uses a guided or guiding question. And guiding questions, many of you um, may already use, and uh, they're very, very helpful in looking at any kind of content. In this specific case, we're looking at ancient civilizations, and our guiding question is, what do laws say about society? Now, this is the kind of guiding question that could be used for a lesson, as we're going to do here. But it can also be applied, don't forget, to an entire unit, uh, even an entire year. If you're looking at an entire year's curriculum, you can keep coming back to a guiding question. And those of you who are familiar with the C3 framework for college, career, and civic life and social studies know that the inquiry model that's built into the C3 framework uh, really is uh, another way of integrating a guiding question. An inquiry is something that uh, students can start off with and through all the different components of their learning, they will keep coming back to the inquiry, or in our case, the guiding question, and that will allow them to, to think critically at each stage of their learning throughout, as I mentioned, a lesson or a unit or even an entire year. Using the guiding question, uh, we're going to take a look here at an example. Remember, you're archaeologists, and this is what you've uncovered digging at, uh, at your site. You found a tablet that has a law written on it. All right, it's not a law written in, in English, but this is what we have to work with here. And the law says, if a son has struck his father, the son's hands shall be cut off. So fortunately, you're archaeologists. You're not reading current US law. And let's take a look at six different aspects of society. These are aspects shared by any society, really. And I want you to see how you can apply what is in this law, the content of this law, and see if it applies to any of the following categories. We've got religion, government slash law, economy, family relations, and environment slash geography. What does this law tell you about any of these five aspects here? Duty and sacrifice, I, I see. Yeah. So that would be perhaps uh, under religion or family relations. I think, Damon, that was our little brief discussion about stoicism mm -hmm. that was going on. 
Yes, Epicureanism, Stoicism. But don't let that throw you. Don't let that throw you because we're going to talk about what civilization this is. Law is harsh. Well, I'm, hmm, what about this law would be harsh? I ask rhetorically. I think someone made a good point here, uh, Marianne. Fa the father is more important than the son. Uh, that's a really valuable observation. Right, yes. So the value within family relations, perhaps even within the law itself, as we look here, who is the most valued member of, of the society? Uh, Rod makes a really good point, too, that, you know, the economic uh, mm -hmm. problem of this. You know, you have a, a, perhaps a culture where working with your hands is a very um, important aspect of life. To lose your hand is, could be catastrophic. Right. Let's see here. It could reflect religion. Honor thy father and mother. And that's interesting. Honor, honor thy father and mother. Because now when I'm looking at this, what does also jump out at me is it has to do with a father-son relationship. So there could be some patriarchy going on in, in this society too. Um, if there's no corresponding law for a mother-daughter, I wonder uh, what, what else that would mean. All right, so let's move forward. Let's take a look at another one. And I'll read this one out to you because the print is a little small in the, the slide there. If a man has hired a boat and boatman and loaded the boat with corn, wool, oil, dates, or anything else, and the boatman has been careless and sunk the boat, the boatman shall restore the boat and whatever was, was lost that was in it. So looking again at our categories, religion, government slash law, economy, family relations, environment slash geography, what does this law tell you about one or more of those aspects? You know, the importance of waterways. Yep, that jumps out. Travel, responsibility, trade relations. Laurel writes, liability law, right, yes. So we've got here who's, who's liable and what's the remedy. Right, so we have different uh, types of um, products. We have different agricultural products that, that are listed here. So my question to all of you now, can you guess what ancient civilization we're talking about? Go ahead and write your answer in the chat area. There's some critical thinking going on, important river, but those goods aren't all in Egypt. So you're thinking Egypt and yet recognizing that not all those, those goods are in Egypt. Mary writes, Hammurabi, hmm. All right, a couple more seconds here. Damon's going to be annoyed for me jumping in on this, but I, a I, lot of translations of ancient texts uh, use corn. Uh, sometimes incorrectly. So one thing you might want to check out when you're looking at translations, uh, realize that is, I shouldn't say it's incorrect, it's a term that often means uh, grain more generally, not corn as we think about it. Right, right. So it's not incorrect, but it could be misleading if you're just asking generally about you know, all ancient civilizations. I do remember uh, from uh, Robert Graves, uh, I Claudius, and the corn factor was a big deal in ancient, ancient Rome there. So something just to explain to students. Wheat, barley, yeah, it's more in line mm -hmm. with that. Right. Babylon, Hammurabi. Ding, ding, ding. That's exactly right. So we were looking, as uh, you surmised, many of you, at excerpts from Hammurabi's code, both those laws. And so we come back to our guiding question, what do laws say about society? And so in doing this lesson, uh, with students actually extracting from the law different aspects of a society, they're also looking at the guiding question. They may not realize that that's specifically what they're doing, but that is what they're doing. What do laws say about society? What do these laws specifically say about the Babylonian dynasty? So what does this look like in the classroom? Well, on the right-hand side here, you see we have excerpts, seven excerpts from Hammurabi's code. And this lesson actually will be available to you on the website, which we'll give you the link to after the webinar. And in your class, I mean, the, the excerpts uh, will be distributed among students in groups. Now, you can do this one of two ways. You can just introduce the unit you're doing on Mesopotamia um, with this lesson, if you want, or the lesson specifically on Hammurabi with this lesson, and it's all transparent. Students are looking at Hammurabi's code, um, and that's fine. The way we're doing it here is a way that you can actually kind of deal with the guiding question generally and also surprise students in a way. So the way we're doing it here is not to tell them yet that it's about Hammurabi or Mesopotamia, the same way I did with you in this webinar, so that students aren't you know, distracted in trying to tie this to something that they might have read for homework or whatever it is, but they're actually just looking at these laws in the abstract and, and trying to learn about the society. 
Uh, also, here's a tip. Um, this is for this simulation, but it can be for any simulation. Don't tell students that they're going to be doing a simulation or role play, or today we're going to do a group activity role play. It's better to say, you are a team of archaeologists and you're deciphering an ancient set of laws, or here's a tablet that you've uncovered. Just kind of get the students into the excitement of being in the simulation without trying to tell them that it's a simulation. Students get really excited when they're actually in the role from the very beginning. So students would get a chart paper. They'd be in groups of maybe four or five each. They'd each have a large chart paper that you would prepare in advance with the five aspects you see here. Leave space at the top for a law strip. And the strip really would be one of these seven laws prepared on a piece of paper, cutouts, and then in each group, the students would glue that strip to the top of the page. And then in their groups, they would look at whatever particular law it was. We looked at a couple of them here. And the one that I have indicated, the first one, if one man has accused another of laying a nurtu or a death spell upon him, but the charge has not been proved, the man making the accusation shall be put to death. And so that would be on the strip and then glued to the top of their chart paper and they would discuss it and they would write under any one or more of these aspects what they're learning from that law about the society. And then you can do the big reveal and tell them that it's going you know, at the end that it's the society of Babylon, ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and you know your students' prior knowledge. You can assess their prior knowledge if they would be able to guess that or if it's just something you just want to reveal to them. And the key about it is that you would be saying, look at how much you already know about Hammurabi and about ancient Mesopotamia without even opening the textbook yet. You've already learned about their economy. You've learned about their religion. You've learned about their family relations, etc. Without even opening the textbook or listening to a, a moment of lecture, they're going to actually get that knowledge and, and go in to the unit well prepared. For fun, uh, there's a cuneiform monogram generator. Cuneiform was, of course, the form of uh, written language that was used in uh, ancient Mesopotamia with uh, you know, doing these sort of marks in clay tablets that were wet clay tablets. And when they dried, you'd see the writing. And I'm going to send around the link to all of the participants here. The University of Pennsylvania, which has an amazing um, archaeological collection, they also have an online cuneiform monogram generator. And down at the bottom, you see, you see here D-A-H. Those are my initials. I generated my monogram in cuneiform. And so it might be kind of cool for your students to be able to, uh, when they're doing these activities or in your unit on Mesopotamia, they get their own cuneiform monogram they can put up on a board or they can have at their seats while they're working through uh, the unit on Mesopotamia or this lesson, in fact. And then to debrief with your students, you come back to the guiding question. And here are some, your students can give you any answer that you think is reasonable. That's great. Uh, a couple of things that you want to make sure that they, they get out of that uh, and you come back to throughout the year or throughout the semester. Laws reflect what a society thinks is important, so beliefs and values in a society. And also, laws are used to resolve common conflicts. Like, for example, when the boat was hired and then the boat sank, you get uh, a way to deal with that conflict in the society. And a third thing that's really interesting, and this could apply in a world history class, you know, ancient history all the way through uh, early modern history in the 20th century, can you see similarities and differences between the laws that you're examining and US laws? So you can actually learn about the uh, students' current culture and society and actually make it um, relevant to them today in laws that they may know about in the US compared to these ancient laws, which is why I, I made sure to reassure you all that we were looking at ancient civilization when we were talking about cutting a son's hands off. Don't worry, it's ancient. And now for all of you, when we debrief the strategy, uh, I'm just want to ask, and you can write your answers in the chat area, why is using a guiding question important? I've told you how you can use it, but I want to find out from you why is it important to use a guiding question? I'll just point out, you know, the idea of having a guiding question to studying history, that's how history really even started. Um, you know, sort of the earliest Greek historian, someone like Herodotus or Thucydides, um, started with questions and answering, and trying to find an answer to the questions. So it's really, to me, mimicking what history is supposed to be. Cynthia points out, students need a focus. It gives students a focus. Yeah, absolutely. A guiding question is, is so important for giving students a focus. Um, giving something to have in mind beforehand, like what we used to 
to uh, refer to, we took, call it a focus. Um, as I learned from Madeline Hunter, an anticipatory set, something that uh, gets students' minds warmed up for whatever the subject is that they're about to, to learn. Seth, that you put up Virginia does not, did not adopt Common Core. Um, and I, again, I, I don't think these, all these techniques are, I mean, we are focusing on the, on the fact that they are tied to Common Core standards, but certainly I think any of these strategies are useful regardless of whether your state has adopted these standards or not. Yeah, I just want to point out, I've, I hear from a lot of social studies teachers, and um, probably many of you on this webinar may be no different, that Common Core might just highlight things that you already do or great techniques that you've already used or already used in your classroom. So it's just really, we're looking at it just to echo what Keith was saying. It's a way for teachers in any state uh, any jurisdiction, whether a common core area or not, to use these strategies. Now let's take a look here. Some of you may have touched on that already, but how did the activity support document analysis? The document, of course, being the law. And let's see, Marianne writes, the activity supports analysis because you're asking them to analyze rather than just regurgitate. Exactly. So it's, it's analysis of a document rather than just what does the document say? You have to know what it says, but what does the document tell you is a, is a bigger question, and that's analysis. Teasing out passages, let's see, I think it means to bolster thinking. Yeah, teasing out passages to bolster thinking. So that's critical thinking, is taking clues, and, and through the clues that are in the, the document, in this case the tablets, building upon that. All right, I'm going to move forward here. So we look at what the Common Core strategies are you supporting this, um, the Common Core Standard, sorry, supporting the strategy. And here are five that uh, I've looked at here in the particular strategy. They're reading in history, social studies. So of course, reading for textual evidence, reading for central ideas in these laws, looking for visual and other information in print and digital text. So depending on how you present it to students. Um, but here they're having a, a print text and they're looking for information that's in it. Now, I used, in these particular slides, I just used a graphic of a tablet. I didn't want to use a papyrus roll or something that might mislead you into thinking, oh, this is Egypt or something like that. But a, a tablet, at least, uh, was a little uh, closer. So there's some visual information. But it's also visual information that just signifies ancient civilization. Damon, and also point out with the, sorry, for the lesson, uh, you did show the picture, though, of the t actual tablet. Uh, you showed the mm -hmm. the actual sculpture. Right, right. So the steel of, thanks for reminding me, the steel of Hammurabi uh, I, I brought up as well. So that was, that came up uh, in the slide, in the big reveal. And of course there are speaking and listening strategies as well too, or standards here, engaging in a range of collaborative discussions, whole class, small group, and also interpreting information in different formats. With that, we've been talking about law in world history, and as promised, we're going to bring it full circle with Keith Matea. All right. So we're going to go back to Montesquieu here. Uh, remember this? Uh, so we're, this was an excerpt from Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws, um, Part 2, Book 12, Chapter 2. Um, we're going to skip past this. This is not the way we're going to uh, approach things. But what we want to think about, I've taken a section of the text. Um, we talked about liberty uh, when we were talking about the Declaration of Independence and ways to think about defining it. And Montesquieu was one of the most important influences, as I said earlier, on the founders. So I've taken a section of text here, and um, what I want us to do here is think about what strategy, now that we've gone through a bunch of different strategies, might be best used to take this text and teach it to students. So um, read the text. I'm going to give you about, I don't know, maybe about 30 seconds to read the text, and then we're going to put up a poll um, afterwards. You'll notice, uh, in terms of uh, when you're reading this, uh, Montesquieu's understanding of political liberty, I think, is quite different from what a lot of you were putting in the chat bar uh, about uh, the meaning of, of liberty. So something to, to keep in mind. So what strategy do you think might be best suited to, to teach this text? Feel free to choose one of the ones we've focused upon uh, or choose other. And if you choose other, please uh, feel free to also uh, chat in the sidebar. As I noted, this is a very important and influential text uh, on our founding documents, which is why we're using it today, obviously talking about uh, liberty 
and one important understanding of liberty that influenced uh, how the founders thought about it. That Eric writes, compare and contrast definitions of liberty right there. Yeah, I think, you know, it's one thing um, you, to go back, uh, I think very early in the webinar someone talked about comparing, or someone mentioned comparing text. I think that's a really valuable way to approach text. You, you give them two texts that are talking about uh, similar ideas, uh, and then you, it really leads to a discussion about the differences or similarities. Laurel writes, I would probably use guiding question and document analysis together. Yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be a great idea. I think this, this is definitely, um, you know, when you're talking about a more difficult text, uh, guiding questions I think are really important here. Laurel's getting some, a lot of agreement here. And so no self-explanation. I, I think you, I, I personally think this would be another interesting text uh, to have students rewrite re 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 -write in their own words, uh, similar to our Declaration of Independence article, or lesson, I should say. I'd be interested to find uh, out Montesquieu's background. Well, he was an Enlightenment thinker, um, fairly well-to-do, um, an educated Frenchman. Uh, certainly, I can give you, when we send out an email, give you a little bit of a background uh, about why he was writing and, and what he thought was important. All right, well, we wanted to, I, again, I wanted to use, or I should say, we wanted to use this just to say, you know, we've given you some strategies, uh, but we really want you to be thinking about, we're going to give you the lessons, um, but thinking about how to use different strategies for a wide variety of texts um, above and beyond what we've presented here. I'm just going to also uh, mention that when Laurel writes to use a combination, that is something we've been uh, angling toward in this presentation. We've talked about it before amongst ourselves, that these strategies we're presenting today do not need to be used in isolation from each other, but they are used best in combination with each other. You can use all three in any lesson here. Now, the webinar you're listening to and all of the webinars in this series that we've had uh, have been made possible by a grant that CRF got from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we created a web page that has lots of resources that are aligned to Common Core state standards. But uh, as someone addressed earlier, these apply even if you're not in a state that has adopted Common Core state standards. They use really good enriching reading and writing strategies. and the URL is here. Don't worry, it's going to come to you in the email. Uh, we have lots of resources on there, including the resources that we are uh, in, work, talked about today. And as you notice in the corner there, every time you use or review one of these resources, you'll be entered in a quarterly drawing for a $100 gift card. Uh, and in fact, I think we're moving into a monthly drawing in the last, uh, these last three months of our grant from the Gates Foundation. So. It's really through that grant that this webinar is possible and all these resources are possible. And filling out one of those surveys not only enters you into this drawing, but really helps us able to keep these free, re free resources coming to you. So uh, please just take a moment to review one of the resources. And if you pile it in your classroom, that's fantastic. We'd love to hear about it. We'd love to know how this works with your students, uh, some of the things that did work and some of the things that didn't work. Uh, really helps us to hear from teachers. So if you do this, any of these lessons with your students, uh, give us uh, the word. We want to thank you. Uh, our emails are up here, so you can email any one of us or all three of us uh, if you want to, uh, asking us any questions or giving us comments on the webinar or the material covered in it. Thanks, everybody. What, this was a really great discussion we had.